Hello and welcome to Higher Automation by High Robotics. I'm your host, Michelle Dawn Mooney. And today we're talking about four tips to identify flexible robotic storage automation. And I have two great guests who are going to help me with this conversation today. Brian Reinhardt is the VP of Sales Solutions and Marketing for High Robotics. And Zach Baim is the VP of Robotic Solutions for High Tech Intra Logistics. Thank you both for being with me today. Thank you. Thanks for having me, boss. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a good conversation. I'm excited to get into this. Before we do, can I have both of you, maybe starting with you, Brian, give a brief bio? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you mentioned, Brian Reinhardt, and I'm currently with High Robotics. I've been in the material handling and industrial automation space for most of my career, about 12 years now. Um, I currently live in Louisville, Kentucky with my wife and young son. Um, I'm an avid sports fan and golfer, so this time of the season, if I'm if I'm not behind a camera or behind the computer, you can usually find me on the golf course. Hi, I'm Zach Baim, uh, Vice President of Solution or Robotic Solutions at High Tech Intra Logistics, uh, which is a new name uh, for us. It used to be High Tech uh, Material Handling. So excited to uh, announce the new uh, name there at Promat that was uh, recently um, we had for a trade show. Um, so I've been in the industry for 18 plus years and have been in custom automation my entire career. Um, and started at uh, was at Advanced Handling Systems and now High Tech Intra Logistics uh, five years ago. Started our robotics team and uh, really been focusing on growing that through our entire network uh, and all of our customers uh, for the last five years. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Yeah, excited to have you both here. And understandably, we have two great guests for the conversation. We clearly know why you're here today. So let's dive into the questions we're talking about identifying flexible robotic storage automation. But let's start off by kind of laying a little framework before we dive into this conversation. What's the difference between changeable and then flexible automation? Uh, so I think that's a, a great question. And our, our definitions will probably going to be a little bit different, a little bit slightly different, but that's, that's okay. So uh, changeable automation is going to be a little bit more difficult. It's going to be more kind of redundant systems, more like shuttle type technologies you're going to see out there. Uh, those types of things um, that are that are a little bit more fixed, right? Uh, flexible automation, you're going to see things that are easily flexible, additional storage, uh, additional robots, and uh, very easy to expand uh, during different times of the year or as a company would grow. Brian, what do you think your uh, definitions would look like? Yeah, it's weird. You know, flexibility, it's, it's a relatively new term to the industry. And I think folks are really trying to quantify it, right? We're a technical field, a bunch of engineering nerds. And so we, we have a, a tendency to put everything into black and white, but flexibility, it really is subjective. And so I think it, it takes numerous shapes and sizes, but, but I think Zach hit, you know, a key element and that is, you know, where on the spectrum of effort um, is required to change or adapt the system. If you have to expand it, if your volume changes, your operation changes, you know, you can throw enough people and money at anything to make it flexible. Um, but can you do it in a cost effective manner that minimizes disruption? Right. Those are some of the key elements that we talk about. And we'll we'll hit each one of these, you know, kind of as, as we go on throughout today. Um, but it's really about ease of change. And I think that's kind of the key concept that we're going to try to really get across in today's message. And and if you have that ease, you know, as easy as can be, that's when you can achieve flexibility. Yeah, because change really is inevitable. But as you talked about the easier you could make it, the better for everybody involved. So now that we have a little more context, let's take a look at some ways that flexible robotic storage automation can be identified. So how can we look for solutions that expand on a larger scale with minimal or even no downtime to operations? You know, it's a great question. And, and again, it, the answer is a bit subjective, right? And so I think that that is something folks need to to understand. But when you're looking for a flexible technology, you really want to run through the thought exercises and the details around what that change management would be. So, you know, if, for instance, our volume spikes 30 percent, what do we do? Do we add more aisles like you would for, you know, a shuttle system? Do we add more um, grid or whatever for maybe a grid type system? Can we just deploy more robots? Do we have to throw labor at it? And each one of those answers has an ease and a difficulty and then a cost associated with it. And so when you're looking for to place a premium on flexibility and adaptability, again, you, you don't want labor to be the answer. You don't want infrastructure to be the answer. 
you want your automation to be the answer and being able to kind of scale it up, scale it down, add to it, remove it in a matter of days or weeks versus months or years. Those are some of the key metrics that you're kind of going to want to look at when you talk about, you know, how you would potentially scale. And uh, add a little bit to Brian's point. So there's there's two really phrases that I'm going to throw out to to kind of amplify what he's saying is first is uh, in the past, we should throw people at it, right? Bring as many people into the building as you can during those people, uh, those peak time frames, and just try to get through, right? The ultimate goal is to get product out of the building. Uh, and then the other, the other phrase I'm going to use is plug and play. And I think that goes exactly with what Brian was highlighting on the flexible side is as an integrator, we're looking for technologies like high that have components that we could plug and play to expand the system, uh, to add to the system, to uh, drive through peak and, and average volumes. But even if you look at some of the different industries that we're working in, it's not just a single time period of the, the year. It's, the, it's maybe the time period of month or at the beginning of the week. Uh, in a lot of these different industries, their peak day is on Monday, Tuesday, and then it trails off. And so how can we flex up and flex down the system, whether it's picking or replenishment or other types of, of uh, things that are going on in the facility, utilizing robotic technology and plugging and playing those types of technologies in it to basically drive the solution for the customer. Yeah, and then, you know, what we talked about is a lot of the, the mechanics of it, right? Like, you know, we're talking about adding equipment, removing equipment, but there's a commercial element too. And so is your solution provider open to ideas like as a service, commercial pricing? Do they have equipment rental or lease to own or lease to buy options, right? These are relatively new concepts to the advanced automation and goods to person space, which traditionally has always acted in a CapEx environment. But the introduction of kind of really flexible AMR and AGV type technology that lends itself to that kind of as a service pricing model is now being expanded up. And so what, what you're seeing is kind of the flexibility of, you know, more simplistic AMR, AGV technology being applied to your traditional high speed, high dense, you know, goods to person technologies. And that's that's kind of all three elements of it coming together, you know, to ultimately as Zach mentioned, you know, serve, serve our partners and our clients. Yeah, you know, I would think another important factor would be finding options that can flex between various facility locations. So how do we do that? So um, that's, that's a good question. So, and that's, every, everybody's trying to attack that. So what they want to do is they want to create kind of a template or a platform across their entire network. And then they want to, as we can use the, the words plug and play with the flexibility of the technology, move um, robotics or solutions from building to building within their network in order to drive to that. But one of the biggest challenges is um, retail really drives a lot of uh, the robotic technologies today. Other industries are definitely catching up. The retail, e-com are really driving a lot of that and their peaks are all at the same exact time, right? And it's like one of those things when we work with a customer and we find out that their peak isn't in that similar time frame. it's kind of like one of those, yes, absolutely. Now we can we can leverage the way to do that and, and spread it across, but there are different ways to approach that than more of the traditional. But again, it, we want to reutilize the technology as much as we can, and we want to move it from building to building or spread it across the network as these companies grow. Because as we work with customers, uh, they may start with one or two buildings, and you may grow that across the entire network and talking about 30 to 40 to 50 buildings. So the technology, again, has to be flexible, as we were talking about earlier, but you have to be able to adapt and, and plug and play into those different solutions uh, wherever you're looking at deploying the technology. Right. You know, you you think about network management, right? Zooming out and looking at it. So let's take Zach's scenario, right? We've got a company and they've taken off and now they have a 30 network DC. Um, 10 years ago, you could manage variance and uncertainty with labor. It was the safety net that everybody had. Um, it was cheap. It was available everywhere. That is not the case now. And so what a lot of companies are doing at the highest level of their kind of distribution and fulfillment networks is looking for opportunities to consolidate, um, reposition, uh, move, relocate, expand, basically trying to navigate that, that lack of labor. And so if you have 30 DCs that now you can't staff, you know, you, you may have 15 that are automated, 15 that are a bit more, you know, manual driven. What do you do? If you have the opportunity or the ability to literally pick up your automation and move it from one facility to the another, all of a sudden your opportunities for expansion, consolidation, you know, whatever you want to do become much more broad, 
Whereas if that infrastructure is more rigid, if it's tied to the ground, if you've invested a ton in the building floor or you know what, whatever it may be, you're just not going to be able to financially justify moving that equipment. And so what that means, it doesn't mean you can't operate. It just means your choices are limited. And so as a you know, facility, as a VP of ops or a director of network planning, you're really handcuffed by your automation. And so the introduction of flexibility at this level is really trying to remove those handcuffs and allow our customers to play with a full set of tools. Did you want to say something? Sam? Yeah, I was going to go ahead and add to that. There's really two sections. So third-party logistics companies, this is Brian literally speaking right to them and the, the challenges that they're dealing with because they're looking at three and five year contracts and they be in maybe in one facility and then the next facility is you know a couple of thousand miles away and they want to move that technology and that's why it's extremely important for it to be flexible and to be able to do what Brian is is referencing uh, and so one of the other areas is micro fulfillment so everybody's trying to get their fulfillment closer to their customer right and so they want to put these smaller more regional DCs in which is going to take a network that may have been 10 facilities to the 30 to 50 facilities. And, and that technology needs to be able to be able to be moved from building to building or uh, city to city, depending upon who they're trying to uh, target. Let's talk about employees for a minute. What key points should be kept in mind with determining solutions that once again are flexible? So, yeah, you know, from, from the employee standpoint, we want to create a, a company, an operation, a job that they can be happy in. Um, warehousing operations has some of the highest turnover rates in the country. And so, you know, speaking on some of the labor issues earlier, even if you can find people these days to work in the warehouse, it's really, really hard to keep them. Um, so one of the beauties of a flexible automation system is that it doesn't put the burden of change on the employee. And what I mean by that was, you know, some of the scenarios we talked earlier, right? So it's Black Friday, all of a sudden you need to work a double, right? And that may be great. Um, but the next week you're back to your regular schedule. And then Monday and Tuesday, we have a hundred people in the warehouse, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we have 30 people in the warehouse due to the weekly order volumes. That's really hard for an employee to plan budget and really kind of, you know, build a life around. And so what flexible automation does, it allows you to kind of space out that workload, plan it much better so that you're removing uncertainty from your, your operator and your employees daily lives, you know, things like, workplace ergonomics and safety, those have kind of been solved. The industry really prioritized those over the last couple of decades, making sure that our people are safe and in a, you know, an ergonomic and you know, workplace conductive environment. But the next step is really kind of letting them know that, yes, there is consistent jobs here. They're forecastable, they're predictable. So when you do recommend a friend to come work for us, it's not just going to be for the seasonal spike around Thanksgiving, they're going to have a job. And so that's kind of what we want to do is, is remove that uncertainty burden from the operator and the business and put it on the automation. The other way that I would put it too, is you want to enable the people that you can get into your building, right? And you enable them by you putting the automation and the robotic technology in. And the, the easiest way I explain it to our customers is when, when we talk to them about it is you're basically putting in an engine, right? And you want to feed that engine and you want to drive as much out of that, out of that engine as you possibly can. So the people that you are able to get into the building in order to work with the goods person system, as an example, or a robotic technology, uh, you want to make sure you set that up perfectly for them. As Brian talked about, uh, ergonomics is, is really kind of been solved to the most part. We're not you know, doing a, a lot of different movements, but it's, it's keeping somebody in the same place and making sure they're not rotating uh, 360 degrees constantly and that type of thing. And you're trying to keep them as efficient as possible. So they don't wear out through the day, whether they're working an eight hour or 10 hour period, because those are the people that you want to get into the building. And those are the people that you want to keep in the building and allow them to be as efficient as possible by leveraging the uh, robotic automation. Yeah, there's there's a pretty consistent trend in the industry that employee feedback surveys from facilities that have automated are consistently higher than those that are non-automated. And there's a few reasons for it. Um, one is, is simple ergonomics. If you automated environments are just less physically stressful than non-automated environments, there's less walking, there's less picking, loading, um, handling and all that. Um, but also it shows an investment in their area of the business on the company's behalf. And so, you know, a lot of companies run their distribution centers or their warehouses almost as loss leaders, like a means to an end. We don't care. Just get the stuff out of the door and don't slow us down. 
But the truly smart and savvy ones invest in that, turn it into a competitive advantage. And that kind of trickles down to all employees. And so that's less about flexibility and more just about general automation. But when you combine it with all the other things that we've talked about, not only does it you know, really help the business, it can help the individual as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So lastly, what should companies be aware of when it comes to looking for automated storage solutions that can adapt workflows quickly for peak season with little to no downtime to adjust? Uh, I'll go ahead and jump in, Brian. Uh, so I think the biggest thing is, is we've talked a lot about plug and play. We use that term many, many times, flexibility. But uh, another piece of uh, part of it is kind of taking everything and breaking it apart. And if you break uh, apart the storage from the robotic technology, from the pick stations or the replen stations, that really allows you to really move the, the chess pieces or the, the pieces around on the board in order to design the right solution for your customer. So they really need to be almost agnostic is maybe the right term uh, in order to keep them separate. So then you can take those pieces together to drive an overall solution. And I think that's one of the biggest things that companies need to look at when they're looking at storage and retrieval systems, uh, whether that's robotic or where that's more fixed automation. Obviously, as we hit earlier, some of the robotic ones are going to be much more flexible in that space than the ones that are the more of the captive or the uh, the fixed automation. Yeah, and I'll take it even just another step more granular, um, right? Because again, the the less limitations we have, the more adjustability and adaptability your operation is going to have. So, you know, I would encourage people ask questions around: Can your automation only handle totes, or can it handle cases? Um, does it have to have one size tote or can we be flexible? Can we reuse our existing infrastructure, whether that be, you know, our racking or our totes? Does it require um, heavy investment in facility upgrades and improvements, whether that be the floor, fire suppression, lighting, temperature control? Um, every time the answer to one of those is, you know, yeah, we can, we can handle the wide range of totes. No, we don't need to level the floor. You become much more adaptable. And I'll use a perfect example. Um, we, there was a particular customer that I had worked with a couple of years back, and we had them in a tote-based um, goods-to-person system. And over their peak, you know, it was, it was really a struggle every year. And what we noticed was that it wasn't necessarily the each picking coming out of the totes, but it was a full case handling operation that was kind of bringing them to their knees. And if we would have been able to put the full case into the tote handling automation, we could have saved them hundreds of, of people. But unfortunately, the automation was just too restrictive. And so when you take it you know, back to that flexibility layer, had we removed that restrictivity, I don't even know if that's a word, but that, that restrictiveness, um, you know, it really could have allowed them to adapt on the fly. And so that was a workflow that changed due to peak season. Unfortunately, the automation wasn't quite flexible enough to handle it. A lot of the new automation on the block, um, it really is. Yeah, and I, just to echo that, it, it, Brian's 100% right. Um, when you drive more volume and some of these facilities are driving like a six or 10 X peak uh, of the same exact SKUs that they're doing less of, you know, the rest of the year. Uh, if you could pick at that higher uh, storage medium, as Brian said, with the case and keep that within the same exact automation, that's going to be key because I'm going to bring that case forward and I'm going to be able to exhaust that case instead of bringing that case back and forth. No, not only is that going to drive up your volume, but also, uh, as an example for the robotic movements, it's going to be much less. And so that's just one way uh, that you could drive efficiency during peak time frame and being able to use different types of robotic automation that can adapt to that. And I, I think that's a, that's a huge key. And that's things that we look at to differentiate ourselves as an integrator, utilizing technology like Hi in those exact scenarios. Any final thoughts as we're wrapping up here? Yeah, you know, I just, again, flexibility is, it's a weird conversation and I'll acknowledge it, right? There's, there's a lot of folks in the industry that'll tell you it's just buzzwords and there's no true value to it. How do you put an ROI on, on flexibility? Um, and what I would say is we don't have to, right? Most flexible technologies are cost competitive on just volume, speed and density areas. And so really now what you're looking to is extra benefit gain, whether you perceive it as tangible or not from that flexibility. And though it may be hard to quantify, it's really easy to see once you start asking these questions that Zach and I have talked about, once you start running the thought exercises around what if this, then that, right? You can see pretty quickly how a flexible automation versus one that's more rigid can really save you a lot of hassle from the unknown. And so 
that's what I would encourage people to do is maybe get a little bit out of that comfort zone, have some of these conversations and, and live in kind of the nuance and subjectivity so you can truly understand the value of flexibility. I'll add one little more tidbit to the, the definition of flexibility. Um, don't always think about flexibility of how I can ex expand the system or move different things around, but entry level is flexibility in that piece of it. So if I could put a system in and I'm putting a two or three robot system in and that gets me started and I start adding more to it or that allows them to get the software portion of that done, the connections and, and really the training piece of it and working with a technology that you could do that and then grow and expand that throughout the entire facility. That is another piece of flexibility too, as well. Not just how we can move the components around or how we could expand during peak or average timeframes, but the entry level. And the better that that becomes more flexible in the industry, the more than more people are going to adopt robotic technologies in their facilities. A lot of great conversation. You covered a lot of territory, but if people are hearing this, they have more questions, they want more information, where can they go? You're okay. I was going to let you answer it first. <laughs> so um, our website is uh, hy-techtek.com, a high-tech intra logistics. So if you just Google us, um, and, and we're, again, uh, kind of rebranding uh, in the industry, and uh, we're all over LinkedIn, YouTube, a ton of great content that's being put out, really driven by technology and allowing us to grow and, and expand within the industry. Yeah, and for us, it's, you know, the website's just hi, H-A-I, robotics.com. Um, but I would encourage anyone listening to, you know, just learn a little bit more about kind of the general trends in automation around this area, whether through us or other providers, and certainly talk to the integrators. Um, you know, companies like Zaxx, they're, they're on the forefront and doing a lot of the hard work behind the scenes for the end users. So they're they're vetting folks like us and ensuring that everything that I just said today is actually realistic in the field which can save a lot of time and effort on the end users uh, side as well. So we're always open to help people on their kind of automation journey, whatever it may be, but there's a lot of really experts in this space that you can rely on. Brian Reinhardt, VP Sales Solutions and Marketing for High Robotics and Zach Bame, VP of Robotic Solutions for High Tech Interlogistics. Thank you both for your time. As I said, great conversation. I'm sure there will be some questions because people want to know a little bit more and they can visit both of those websites, but I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. Appreciate yours. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to Higher Automation brought to you by High Robotics. Of course, you want to subscribe to this podcast to hear more great conversations like the one you heard today. I'm your host, Michelle Dawn Mooney. Thanks again for joining us. And we hope to see you soon.